Hello, I'm Chancellor Emeritus James Mieser, and my guest today is Ruhl Tyson, the founder and director emeritus of the Institute for Arts and Humanities on the UNC campus. The Institute is one of the singular programs that makes UNC really a distinguished university. And Ruhl founded this institute a number of years ago, really from a brown bag lunch with faculty who were, who were upset about the fact that the humanities and the arts seem to be being ignored by the provost and the leadership of the university as the university moved more and more towards science and technology. And through this creative set of conversations, something was born, something was created that now really helps define the university that we know and cherish today. The Institute for Arts and Humanities is, in my view, the place that really is the, is the cement for our faculty. And Ruhl, I think you helped make that happen. Now we have two signature programs, the faculty fellowship programs, which is like an internal sabbatical for, faculties, uh, for faculty to come together in small groups and work on projects as a community, and the academic leadership program, which has trained and, and uh, much of our current leadership, several of our deans, department chairs, Chancellor Holden Thorpe, are all alumni of the academic leadership program. Uh, when I was chancellor, I used to talk about being the leading public university. And I, I, I thought we could do it, and I think we are doing it through the leadership of faculty, faculty like Ruhl Tyson. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation today to talk about your good to great story of building the Institute for Arts and Humanities. Thank you. Tell us how all of this began. Every narrative has multiple beginnings, most of which fortunately we forget. So this is going to be seemingly way out. Okay. I want to tell you a story about Mr. Flood at the Dublin Zoo, <laughs> uh, recounted in a wonderful article by a man appropriately named as Professor John Wisdom. He was a philosopher, of course. Okay. Mr. Flood was asked by a reporter in what consists his impeccable record of training lions. And he paused and he thought and he said, every lion is different. And in what consists of success in training lions? Every lion is different. Then the reporter added to his article, of course, Mr. Flood brought to bear all the knowledge he had of all the other lions, but when he was training a lion, he focused, concentrated entirely on that one. So there are a lot of lions in this story yeah. that will have to uh, be quiet for a while, and I will uh, speak on behalf of one of them or two of them. It started once upon a time, right? You mm -hmm. get the echo. Mm -hmm. right, We're right. engaging between history and myth here. Right. Uh, it started perhaps um, when I was ill with rheumatic fever as a second grader, missing uh, six months of, cl of class. And that was before the era of penicillin. Right. And I had to entertain myself for long hours in the afternoon because both my parents worked. And so my, the tools of my entertainment were a few toys and the Citizen Robot catalog. And the Citizen Robot catalog furnished me with an array of images with which I imagined someplace else than a bed confined, rather the woods and a stream and a campsite. And so I imagined with different variations and alterations each afternoon a different campsite. I later you're lying, found you're it, lying in bed with rheumatic fever. Exactly. With the fevered, but right. not fevered out of my head, but right. en enough yeah. of a throb to perhaps free me from the practical world. Uh, because I knew if I got too active, the temperature would go up and I right. would stay in bed longer. So that's a calculus there. So what was fascinating to me is uh, later I learned a phrase from Henry James. The novelist, he says, always looks for the other possible case. And I have to say, as I look back on my so-called career, I have that inclination, this is how things are, but what's the possible other way of having what we have now or having something we don't have now? What is the other possible case? So in a sense, it's the way I think and imagine that is the one layer of the story that you've asked me to tell you. So the second, perhaps more, but a relative to, 
not a zoo story or mm -hmm. bed story, but this is a corner of uh, a crossroads story. Um, by the way, we often talked about the Institute as a crossroads where right. different disciplinarians, artists, visitors, uh, colleagues met uh, around the Cracker Barrel, proverbially. Right. In our case, it was around the almost din literally, a, a yeah. dinner table, almost literally. So um, in the afternoons, we had um, a relief from the work in the field, and we often would go to a place called Mr. Elk's Service Station, located in Ballage Crossroads, North Carolina, in Pitt County, in the eastern part of the state. And there, uh, the, uh, the proverbial was the real, namely the pot-bellied stove, the box of crackers, right. and the loaf, and the slab of cheese. Slab, right. Yeah. So that's where the conversation was, but I didn't participate because I was bored by this adult talk. So I imagined what was in all the packages uh, on, the, <laughs> on the shelves. There again, uh, I don't want to be here, I'd rather be eating right, a, right. A, a cereal or whatever it is, or the candy, right? So again, a little glimpse of what later I learned from my father, who was a politician. I would go with him on Saturdays uh, to various country stores. And again, pretty bored by what was happening, but he was doing his politicking about which he rarely spoke explicitly. He was talking about the crops right. and indebtedness and President Roosevelt and all of these the difficult topics for a seven or eight year old. But at the same time, I, without knowing it, I learned a lot. And your uh, daddy was the sh high the sheriff, sheriff, as they called it in those days, yes. uh, the sheriff of Pitt County, uh, served four terms. And uh, my mother was also a politician uh, in a different mode, quiet strength, whereas his was not display, but quiet conversation. Mm -hmm. So I had interesting models of, of mother and father, each of whom, by the way, came from families of six siblings each, which is a crowd graduated, right. and so I learned a lot about negotiating with other people while I was only a child with all my cousins. We were a great uh, team, which sometimes had falling out. Right. <laughs> so how to manage uh, conflict was another uh, early right. learning in right. that regard. Going forward, um, there was a an address by the provost back in 1980. But just to finish up with, yeah. with your father, what mm -hmm. you were observing there was his his politicking without seeming to politics. Exactly. Creating indirect relationships. I used to call it, I learned to call it indirect discourse. Right. To put an academic title right. on it. He was talking about something by not talking about he, it, he but by being present him. in a certain way. Right. Right. And he, did he or did he not ask them to actually vote for him? That was the, that was that, that was the set of lines he used as he left. Uh, oh, by the way? Uh, oh, by the way, I hope you all will vote for me. Yeah. Uh, and he gave the date. And if you need transportation, let uh, me know. We'll do that. And so it was very soft pedal, yes. but showing up yes. and talking about what was important to the people in that station, namely the crops, right. the economy, right. uh, is another way of talking about politics, as right. we well know. So that was his genius, I think. Yeah. And his uh, other genius, by the way, was being a counselor. I would go to his office after school and have to wait for him because he would always have somebody back in his small private office. And often when that door opened, it was a couple, mm -hmm. and it turns out years later, I asked, what were you doing back there with this man and wife? He said, I was trying to keep them from uh, dissolving their marriage. They had a fight Saturday night and wow. called the police, they called the sheriff, you see. Right. So I met them under adverse circumstances in their kitchen with a knife out. So uh, he had called them together on a, a Monday afternoon. A sheriff with a pastoral relationship. That's correct. So, uh, listening again yeah. and standing as a mediator. Yeah. Uh, so those were the early elementary lessons in the politics of persuasion, which is not dramatic, but understated, right. but right. persistent. As I like to say, one of my mottos is persistence and patience, right. and then try again. <laughs> right. Expect, right. my wife and I, totally different. That's why we have a, a good marriage. She expects things to go right. I expect them to go wrong. She's always being disappointed. I'm always being surprised. <laughs> so it's a kind of right. equipoise there right. between right. Our, our, right. our notions. So back in, uh, back in this life, in Chapel Hill life, um, there was a provocative address by a provost. And this is about when? This would be about 1984, okay. I would say. 
And for some reason, he felt called upon to say to the faculty assembled, and this was not just the college, but the, the university faculty, uh, the sciences are on the rise, but the humanities seem not to be keeping up. And I can't remember anything else he said, because I heard that latter phrase, right. not keeping up. Death knell for the humanities. So that was the first provocation, as yeah. I like to call it. The second provocation was, I had to assume, resume uh, the acting chairmanship of my department because of an accident that occurred to the uh, chairman. And I realized then what desperate straits we were in terms yeah. of lack of material salary increases, a lot of lacks, uh, including uh, any sense of fellowship across the faculty. Right. Um, the most dreary meetings I ever and attended. And this is a very good department of oh, religious yes, studies, yes, even it, back it, in the this, this is This is raising a standard above right. our goodness, right? Yes. It's to, to try to be better. And so um, I decided that I would call a meeting, uh, unofficially and for purposes of discussion. So I assembled in the conference room in Saunders Hall, a group of about 13 faculty members. And the revolutionary thing about this meeting, it encompassed, included faculty from the departments of art and music, along with the, the expected one, philosophy, English, history, so this was the not, languages. This was not your departmental faculty? No, no, this, no. Okay. no this is members of my, people I'd known okay. in, in committees. That's how you, in the absence of a faculty club, you got to know people right. by serving on committees right. with them in, the, in, the, in those right. days. So we began uh, with the annual, with the initial uh, two weeks devoted to griping and complaining. And then it the, seemed to me the time was right to move off that note and to uh, what are we going to do about our situation but this, here. But you called this meeting yeah, called in, in response to the provost. Exactly. The and I called it, the yeah, without authorization, you might say. That, that's uh, that's uh, maybe italicized. Uh, if I'm asking what uh, leadership often translates out to be, I would say, well, doing things without authorization. Right. And being willing to take the consequences if... Uh, so the tenor of these meetings was, first of all, just, uh, as you said, mutual griping and, right. and complaining. Right, and, and, and what can we do right. about our situation? What was us? So uh, that began to shift uh, the conversation. I said, well, what can we do about our situation? And we had several members of that group, I did not know this, who said, well, I've spent last year at Stanford in their wonderful Institute for Humanities at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Or oh, I have heard about the Institute at Wesleyan. Or oh, I heard about the one at Yale. And we began to explore the uh, idea of having a third place, neither home nor work, but a third place on campus in which faculty could meet on a regular basis to explore ideas and to improve our teaching and to increase our fellowship in order perhaps to energize ourselves collectively, unlike the classic soloists that we are, right. possessive individualists, I right. call ourselves, right. overcome the uh, entrapment of expertise and learn to talk laterally about common problems. Among these people you, you drew together, did they, did they know each other? They knew each other in passing, as we say. Yeah. And if they had served on committees together, they knew each yeah. other. And they knew each other by certain reputations, usually good reputations, right. yeah. So yes, there was a sort of prehistory here that I was trying to tap into and to make self-conscious. That, that's, so that's one of the, so uh, we got over the griping, we got serious about ideas. We began reporting in uh, almost fantasies sometimes, but mm -hmm. also experiences that we've had. And so in my case, I told the story of the um, Society for Values in Our Education, to which I belonged for 20 years, made up of uh, former Danforth graduate fellows and former Kent fellows, right. not all of whom by any means were in religion, by the way. Right. So we had an annual week of work on some college campus every summer for four days or five days with family. Were you a Kent fellow? Uh, I was a Danforth, Danforth fellow. Yeah, Danforth so fellow. There's something else that we share about. Yeah, it. we do. Right, yes. indeed. So uh, that was my model. Let's uh, see if we can get together. I hadn't thought about uh, what form that would take, but the combination of recreation, intellectual exchange, eating together, and playing together yeah. could not be beat, it seemed to me, to build right. up a kind of solidity of fellowship, uh, uh, so it's fluid fellowship rather than so. But so uh, that was feeding my imagination. And so um, to skip some passages here now, 
I was able to be a senior fellow at the Institute for uh, Humanities, uh, Center for the Humanities at Wesleyan University in Middletown, uh, Connecticut. So did you take a sabbatical leave? I had a sabbatical leave okay. after serving for a full five-year term as, as, chair. as chair of the faculty. Yeah. And there I saw in action on a weekly basis an extraordinary phenomenon called conversation. Yeah. Uh, around based around uh, serious disciplinary investigations, yet opening out to the members of this uh, continuing group. So the format was fairly simple. We would have a lecture on Monday evening for the whole community to right, attend. Right. On Monday midday, we would meet for lunch, very simple lunch, followed by three hours of uninterrupted, go for it. Now these are humanities fellows all at Wesleyan. faculty at Wesleyan. The exception being myself and one other a couple of, person. So you managed to be we were senior, so, senior so-called okay. senior scholars there. Good. And so um, the other thing that was unique there, I believe, was that there was a theme, a very generous, large yeah. theme that informed specific discussions. The theme for the two semesters I was there was the book. Right. We were just beginning to hear about the future of uh, printing and right. all of that that we now know was underway. And the second theme, about which we know more now, of course, was war. So oh. one semester was the theme, the book, and the other war. Mm. So that gave a loose definition of fo focus, but not preempting everyone's own special interest, which we all had a week in which we got to give our project report, invite Right. critique. And the critiques were rigorous, but the manner in which they were pursued were generous. Oh. Oh. Not a bad... Yeah, good well, model. Good model, right. Yeah. So I came back with a, a buzz in my yeah. head, and I now had... Was that a semester-long leave? Uh, no, I, I was a year. I was, okay. very, I was very generous. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Great. And then the following summer, I spent in Oxford, where I had a, a renewal of my understanding of the, an Oxford College, which mm -hmm. I, I had been at uh, Merton College and uh, uh, at Merton College uh, for a year with my mentor, Michael Polanyi. So going back there and uh, being a guest at All Souls reminded me of, again, another model of fellowship, right, right. a different one from the one that we were imagining and were practicing here, but yet it had its feed in right. to the imagination of what this could be. One negative uh, fed in that I never forgot, it turns out that in All Souls College there's a rule against speaking across the table. Well, in my case, I was sitting precisely opposite a young woman who was the first female fellow of All Souls College. Not only a PhD in philosophy, but a degree in law. Right. And I wasn't able to talk to her. You couldn't talk to her? I couldn't talk to her. Oh, in common room I could. Before and after. But not table. across the table. I had to go right or left. Oh. I don't know whether that's a political statement or what, but uh, I said, if I ever have in charge of a table like this, this will not happen. And it never <laughs> did, as a result. No, 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 you'll have round tables. That's round tables, <laughs> round, uh, exactly. Round tables and crossroads right. is uh, the two metaphors right. that, I, that I like to cross. That's a great, so that is, so that, this seed was planted or, and it began to germinate yes. during your time at West And then you so. come back to Chapel Hill. I come back to Chapel what Hill. What happens? Yeah. yeah. What happens? Um, well, I remember the sessions that we had had uh, before I left. Right. Uh, I may have the chronology a little jagged there, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. that, that played into my next move, uh, which was... Uh, Unplanned by me, I was asked by Dean Sell to uh, this is Jillian Sell, Jillian Sell, of the college. a much revered uh, leader, and crucial to the history right. of this institute. Uh, I was asked by her if I wanted to uh, serve the Arts and Sciences Foundation for ten hours a week as the sort of faculty representative with the development officer. Well, that was and, very. Uh, in, she didn't know how insightful that, or <laughs> that move that was. Well, well I what didn't did know what, how much I was learning. Yeah, what did they do for you? What did it be? Well, I had a great mentor, and I, I do regret that I cannot recall. Uh, I, he was the first director of the Arts and Sciences mm -hmm. Foundation in early, early days. And he, I learned some of the elementary forms of calls, making right. calls, right. and stewardship from this, now, this man. Now, let me interrupt. As yeah. a faculty member, how did, what was your view about fundraising and development at that point? 
Ah. I can just, speaking for myself, right. I, I remember as a young faculty member regarding that as kind of something an academic would never want to get involved. Yeah. You yeah. wouldn't want to dirty your hands. Well, here's where the uh, being a chair and seeing the budget and seeing yeah. the, the lack Open of chair. salaries uh, helped. Yes. Uh, there must be a relationship between this fundraising and that bottom line right. eventually. Right. So, if, you, if we so do you'd it already well. seen the need. Yeah, I had. Clearly. I'd already identified the, right. the need. And I knew the need had to be enveloped and articulated within an academic genre that was justifying and justified for colleagues to participate. So it, it, you, it's, a, it's a dialectic between need and style right. that you need to perfect here. And I learned it at the, you know, at the side of going on, just like I was down at the filling station, right? Right, right. Uh, listening to my father, not politic, but so, politics. So 10 hours a week you're dispatched to the Arts and Sciences That's Foundation correct. as a kind of, as a faculty advisor or a mentor? Just, just a liaison. As a liaison. I was supposed to represent the voice of the faculty. Uh, insofar as one could say that we still voice. do that because that's really an insightful thing to do. I, I, I don't, I don't, really I don't think so, but I don't. I wouldn't say what, what that's. Uh, in it, any case, it, I learned a lot. Yes. So, and we, I remember vividly our calls, uh, who we talked to, and what, how many mistakes we made, right. and how we so laughed. You about actually, them. went on calls. Oh yes, with the with the, de with the dean and yes. with the development officer. Uh, sometimes two of us, sometimes three of yeah. us. If the if the if the worthy was large, we would all three go. Right. Right. <laughs> and then we would do uh, proposal writing. Ah, so you were involved. Uh, here's, in a, here's, uh, here's, here's a learning for the professor. The first letter I wrote on behalf of the institute, what became the institute, right. was to my former students. Right. Guess what? The letter was two pages, single spaced. And I showed that to a development officer. Right. Horrors! <laughs> horrors! Nobody's going to read this, even to you, Tyson. <laughs> so I've learned to write the Two paragraphs? The elevator speech. The elevator speech, but a little right. bit longer because yes. at least, it, well, may, I need a 60-story building for right. my speech, <laughs> not a, not a two-story building like the current institute. So, so yes, I, I learned a lot. So I had my apprenticeship. Right. Good. That's, that's fabulous. I, I, I had forgotten that. It's coming very clear yeah. now under the inspiration of your questions why that was so important to me right. uh, and how I, I did have somebody to, who's, at whose elbow I was observing and right. And the other thing that we have talked about in the past was the centrality of uh, forming appropriate composite boards. Right. So one of my ambitions at the Institute is, as it began to get underway was to draw in people from diverse fields in different so, generations right. of, of graduates into our board. I want to come back to that, but first, right. first, I want you to I w complete the loop here. All right. So you've you've been to Westland. You've had now you have this experience with the foundation. Okay. Where, well, at some point you must draw, draw, you must write up a description of what it is you want to create and present it to somebody. Well, yes, that's right. But that that came later. Still to come. Uh, still to come because what I was doing now was uh, what I call late afternoon calls on certain colleagues to ask advice. On campus. And to, on campus. Try out my sort of, mm -hmm. if you like, my presentation. So you're shopping this idea. I, I was you're, shopping it's, this idea. It's still idea. forming in your but mind? It was still forming. And the questions I got uh, helped me form and also convict me of malformation, yes, you might say. Yes. So one of the partners in this quiet, off late afternoon conversation um, was a chemist well known in these parts named Bill Little. Very well I known remember and very, very important to the history of this university. Indeed, indeed. And I had the good sense, retrospectively, you know, he was just a big dame. Well, he knows how to do this. He's done X, Y, and Z. So I go knock on his Critical door. Critical in the formation of the research trial. Exactly. Park, a major member of the chemistry faculty. Indeed, very indeed. Important. So here I was walking over there in Venable Hall uh, in the dark, those dark corridors away. The, I found him. To the center of science. Which That's is, correct. Which is what and, you were concerned uh, about. It's not it's not, uh, it's not just ironical that my mentor, Polanyi, was a physical chemist. Yeah. And that was the first topic of conversation, okay. of course, when I talked to scientists. Uh, they would know of his work. And since uh, Polanyi had been at Duke for a term, uh -huh. uh, one of our own physics faculty endowed a lectureship still going on in, in Polanyi's honor here on our campus, you see. So we own, own a little bit of Polanyi's here. So that was an entree. And the questions Bill asked me, along with other people he suggested I right. call upon, 
uh, was invaluable. So he's coaching. That, he's he was coaching. That, yeah, he, he was so he coach. sent you to other people that you yeah, really oh yeah, you ought to see so and so. And before it ended, uh, I, I, as typical, you get excited about these things. I was calling on John Caldwell, the right. chancellor of NC State University, not because he was chancellor of NC State University, but because he was the chairman of the board of Tukasi. Ah. Research Triangle Universities, da, 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 da. Triangle Research Universities. Yeah, all that. Right. Because again, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's that, where, actually, where NC State, Duke, and UNC come together. Come together. The park. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So he was again. I, I had got to know him as fellow board members of the North County Humanities right. Council. So right. I was tapping on all of those right. relationships that had seemed, in, when I did them as a matter of routine duty, and now they I, they came back to me as right. opportunities for right. gaining critique and. Uh, ideas from uh, these people. Fabulous. So, so you're so this idea continues to form, right? And, and as right. you as you consult around campus with your colleagues. All right. Now we can go back to that famous fourteen of us in the in, in, back to your in book, in, in, brown, in, brown, 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 brown brown lunch, and so. Uh, the third, the fourth meeting, I now said, why don't stay together? By the group stay together because we were all teaching summer school. You see, I we see. had to be there uh, because we had to meet our classes on a daily basis. Right. So. It was a good group, happily. Over how many years would you say this conversation? This only the last five weeks. This conversation this that I'm talking all about only at, all, okay. All, all one first term of summer school. Okay. But this is but it's after Westland then. Yes, is, after Westland. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, the day before the, the the week before the last week, I said we ought to put something on paper, and we did. And fortunately, uh, my discursiveness was overruled, and the crispness of somebody else uh, prevailed. And so we got a draft. So we had that and then we revised it and said, okay, we should invite the dean to have our final bag lunch with us. Dean so Sell arrives so. uh, with a brown bag and a, and a yellow tablet. As far as I could see, it was blank. But during the course of the conversation, it got filled up with notes. And at the end of the uh, conversation, she said, I think you got something going important here. And then said goodbye. And I said, oops, is that it? That afternoon, I got a phone call. Will you chair a feasibility committee for an institute or center for the arts and humanities in the college. Well, wow. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I didn't, usually I would say, it, let me think about it. Right. But in this case, yes, ma'am. Right. Right. So then 17 of us worked twice a week for four months in the following in fall. The fa in the fall semester. Fall semester. We met in the second floor of the library. And we, um, I, I thought you were supposed to do this, so I did it. I, I didn't have a, a scenario. We invited the director of the National Humanities uh, Center to right. come talk to us and some other people, uh, mainly for our own sounding board right. and listen to them respond to our ideas. The good news and unusual, good because unusual, here's a faculty committee that got its report together in three months. Presented it to the dean, but not yet. Dr sent a draft. Mm -hmm. of our report to every chair in the College of Arts and Sciences. And only one had anything centrally negative to say about it. Misunderstood our purposes by saying, you're not supporting teaching. Of course yeah. we're supporting yeah. teaching, but that's, that's okay. That's, that's a pretty okay. good record. Yeah. So then we rewrote. But it was also a, a smart move to run this by the chairs. Oh, yes. You knew what you were, politically that was smart. Oh yes, yes. Uh, we call this precinct work. Where right, exactly. From. You learned that precinct. from your father. I did, uh, precinct work. So what happened is then we presented it to the dean and uh, she had a few comments, and we took back. I said, could also you... Also smart to send her a draft oh, before yeah. you've finished it. I said, uh, could you spare um, one night and three meals for us at Aqueduct? We need to have one final wrap-up on this, especially in the light of your remarks. Oh, yeah, okay. So we go out to Aqueduct. A, with her? With, no, no. Oh, oh, without her? Just the committee. Just the committee, okay. So we go out and have that kind of conversation. And we got to a Donnybrook at one point, and bless his heart, extraordinary member of the philosophy department, said, you know, I think we should have a recess now. Well, uh, what were you divided about? I don't remember the issue, okay. but it was some crucial point. It might have been on the teaching uh, research uh, nexus, or it might have been on frequency of, uh, I've, I've forgotten yeah. the details, but the point is a serious blockage had emerged. He drives into town, buys a Frisbee, comes back to Aqueduct, and we have a game of Frisbee. <laughs> now, one of our members was, uh, I would say, in late 60s. Yeah. She participated 
Everybody participated, even though they never had a frisbee in their hand, probably. And we this came back. After, this is after dinner, a little frisbee. Yes, what the humans call Homo ludens. This right. was man play, men right. play, people play. We came back in, and I don't know what happened, but we all signed off well, on the issue. And then we could present it. The dean uh, accepted it and presented it to the uh, Arts and Sciences Exec Committee. And uh, we didn't get a perfect vote, but uh, we ended up with a budget of 10K for our first day, uh, year of operation. And, and what, was, what was it? What was the and, It was uh, initial... to have a fellowship program for faculty for one semester right. in a common place. We had no it's idea about building. How many faculty? Seven, ten? We were aiming, we, would, we were not very, we said eight around okay. the table. We had to have eight. Yeah. And we had to have it going Semest both semesters. Semest semester long, semester long in-house. 14 weeks per semester, right. both sem a different group each semester. So we would be serving, say, at in best of times, uh, 16 to 20 uh, a year. faculty a year. Right. So I go up um, and meet with the dean. And as I walk in her door, she says, you have West House. I was going to say, I that said, was my next question. I How said, did you get a place? Where is that? And her face fell. I said, oh, you mean that white two-story building right next to Hain Hall? She said, no, 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 the little brick bungalow next to, you know. oh, I'd never been in it. But I did go right away. She said, the provost has given that to this program for arts and humanities, what it was called. Right. As you know, in those days, I think still, you have to have Board of Governors approval for an in, a genuine institute, we, and we were still working as a program. So uh, I go to West House and knock on the door. No one answered. I open it and looked around the corner, and there Fred Brooks sat. It was his office in those days prior to moving to Citizen Hall, which was under construction. Fred Brooks, a major computer scientist. On Indeed. Campus. Well, we were, high, we were grammar school mates in, right, you, uh, in, in Greenville, yeah. right? So we, we graduated together. Right. So Fred school. was about to move out. That's right, right, right. Newly constructed. And the whole, all home. walls were riveted with wire and we, right. you tripped along and he had his graduate students and carols down the hallway. And we should say Fred, West House was this charming little brick house that was actually built by a by the by, Tanner family, by the Tanner family of, to house uh, his son. His son didn't want him to have to live right. in the residence hall. And they had a graduate student as a, as a resident and who, the first one was uh, uh, the distinguished Southern historian. Uh, whose name is slipping for me right now, but uh, Ben Woodward. Ben Woodward. That's right. So I've talked to him about how to do a dissertation in a small building less than a thousand square feet with four undergraduates right. and one graduate. So that's so, a West House, which yeah. became the headquarters for this that's institute. Right. And uh, I think the space, because it had a back garden with a curled wall, right. with an arbor, and the chairs, the director's office opened directly into this arbor, a perfect place for free dinner libations, and then the 12 people could sit in the table at front. Windows on all sides but one, three sides, right. three sided windows. And we already had, not knowing it of course, the recipe for the central space in the institute when, in its new building. It was you know, a very humane it was. structure. Garden. Uh, it was, in fact, one of the most controversial things I did as chancellor was to have it demolished. Yes, yes. Um, I did not enter the fray. I, I think, I, and I thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it was for the greater good of yeah, indeed, constructing the indeed, Keenan Music Building. It did. After which, all, we were sporting the arts at the that's Institute, right. remember? That's right. <laughs> but were, it, was, uh, it was, and it was this in, uh, building, it was really in the way, but it was a charming little structure. It was, a jewel, as we like to call yeah. that. With a distinguished architect and, and, uh, and gardener. who had, uh, Coker, I think, had actually Coker, designed yeah, the garden. That's right. Yeah, indeed. Right. So it only cost $4,300, by the way. I saw the original plans for the, in those days. A lot of money. So you were in, so you were, the, the program exists. You have, uh, and now I want to go to the thing which you alluded to a minute ago. Right. I think because you must have, at the same time, you, you began to assemble support from outside the yes. university. Yes. Now, yes, Drawing on your experience at the foundation. Yes. So how did that process unfold? Well, ruthless exploitation of former students <laughs> would be the real answer. And there were three in particular, uh, both living in Atlanta and working there, and it so happened all of them were lawyers at that point. They had been in about 12 years out. And so I go down and we have lunch and I put before them uh, what I'd hoped we would do. We had this wonderful place called West House. 
but we have to uh, we have to have fellowships. And you have a ten thousand dollar university budget. <laughs> That's is, right. You know. <laughs> and so um, um, they said, "Well, we'll help you, but we need help too." Yes. I said, we go to midwinter seminars at the University of Georgia in Athens because we want some extracurricular intellectual stimulation. What's Carolina going to do for us? Right. I said, never mind. It will do a lot for you, and I will see to it. So that was our deal. Right. You help me, I, I'm going to. So they, they were looking for some intellectual exactly. nourishment. And the, and the mesh between being a, a fundraiser or a supporter or an advocate or board member, all the above, right. met together. They meshed those, their need and ours. And uh, what is so interesting, each of them, of course, are well, was well known in that larger community. So many of the people senior to them heard about the Institute many years before we got around to knocking on their right, door. Right. And which, I didn't know this was happening. It, 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 it's nice to pretend you had all this psyched out, but no, no, it's intuitive. You see, I think all this talk about vision is very deceptive. I think we see vision in the rear view mirror right, after right. where we've gone a ways. And it matches another of my favorite uh, quotations from uh, one of my philosophical heroes, uh, a Dane named Sorcery and Kierkegaard. We live our lives forward, but we understand them backwards. Right. And so I'm giving you the backward right, reflections right. and anecdotes, not as they happened, but, uh, but as I re recollect them as I respond to your questions. So what kind of intellectual nourishment and when, how did you provide this? How did you right. go about doing right. it? Well, it seems almost you need to invent some rather complicated academic terms for it, but I, I had refused to do that. Um, the components, now that I can list them, a group of people representing diverse arts and sciences and humanities, sitting in the same space for two or three hours with appropriate interruptions, sharing a meal, listening to each other chatter and talk over a meal, and then one of our kind makes a no longer than 25 minute presentation in a language the rest of us can understand. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is not inside baseball here. Right. We're not in our disciplinary guild here. Right. We're in a emergent community of conversation that we have to build ourselves because we come with blinders and we've got to learn how to expand this. I'm reminded of a wonderful anecdote, Bill Bradley, of the famous basketball player right, at Princeton. Right. He would walk down Nassau Street and practice expanding his peripheral vision. That's what we were trying to do right. in these discussions. Uh -huh. We were expanding peripheral vision because the farther you go out, the more connections you make. Right. The closer you in, fewer the connections. So that's a, a dynamic of a conversation. So that's what I was trying to establish. A conversational polity, as I called right. it, in the, uh, in the little talk I gave at the dedication of the building. We want, we want to establish a polity of conversation in which diverse and controversial viewpoints are expressed, respected, disputed, re resolved, and re reframed. Right. All, the, all the re part. Research, research so, reframe. So that was your first step. That was first step. Beginning to draw these people in, yeah. and, re and in some cases reconnecting them with re their oh, university. Oh yes, and with their former students. Right. Uh, then what was the next step? Because obviously you're moving toward, or at some point, toward the formation of a, of yes. a board, which has been very uh, so right. Well, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of uh, the Atlanta three, we'll call them right. in this case, uh, was an obvious. Uh, choice for starting our board, and that was Buck Goldstein. Right. So he, he came aboard, and um, we began to think about forming a board. Well, I had already discovered by listening, uh, I, I read newspapers. I wanted to be a newspaper journalist, ultimately, but that didn't work out, <laughs> I'm glad to say. Uh, but I read the newspapers critically, about what they say and what they don't say, and how they say what they do say. I read that as a result of a discussion at the Board of Trustees meeting some years earlier, Dick Jenrette had asked the Director of Development University, why was it that when we went around to different boards at the university, kept seeing the same faces? He says, that means the same generations, that means the same fraternity, that means the same sorority. Well, it wasn't a good answer given. I said, 
that will, that will not happen to our board. We're going to have a board graduated in three tiers at least, and then we're going to rotate in and out. Right, right. And, uh, and that's how we worked it. Multi-generation. Multi-generation and different sections of interest. All, all, all men, of course. No. <laughs> no, never. Okay. <laughs> As we started out, uh, I, I, I can't remember numbers, but it yeah. was strong women yes. uh, cause. This was fed. You had some very strong women. Indeed, indeed. This board was actually fed by a subsidiary activity of the Institute, something we called Autumn Saturday. We, it's kind of like an all-day meeting, and it had food and had lots of reminiscences about one day with students. We had one of our current undergraduates give each of them a Pri their own private tour of the campus, as right, they saw right. it, building up relationships between students who were here then and former students who'd been out 15 to 20 years in some cases. So we were already bridging the undergraduate, postgraduate uh, connections while identifying potential board members from the Autumn Saturday uh, moment. Autumn Saturday was like a Chautauqua, presentations, musical performance, skits, old time lying, uh, drink, right. uh, drinking around the table and to toasting, it turned out, toasting former faculty members. That was unplanned on, on my part. Wow. One, stu one, I remember his name from Goldsboro, stood up and said, I'd like to toast Professor Peck for the being, my life was changed in Memorial Hall listening to Professor Peck lecture on Abraham and Isaac. Wow. And we're, oh, so that, everyone, stood up. and then it kept happening, electric around the room, Professor Thorne said, they all ought to be here hearing this. So again, we expanded. These uh, effervescent uh, explosions right. are fraught with future ideas if you know how to construe right. them. I claim to know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, Will, what would you, what would you uh, say has been the effect of the, of the Having created the institute and, and, and all these faculty who have participated, how is this a different university as a result? Well, let me think about that. First, uh, I, I perpetually object to being called, you created it. All right. Uh, there was a whole group. Uh, I was a figurehead. Well, I was we, a cheerleader. We, we, well, we won't you be know, contentious. Yeah, we okay. But I mean, not to argue the point. But but the but, get, but, but the question is critical. Though. How has the university changed, or has it been changed as a result? Right. Well, I think I can best respond by giving you a very very specific program. As we again began to have fellows uh, over time, mm -hmm. they went through the ranks, of course, promotion, right. and met several of them, almost the same year, became chairs of that department. And independently, at least four of those new chairs came to me and said, I don't know how to be a chair. What do I do? I said, we'll have a breakfast. The one power I had as director of the institute was to have breakfast, come for breakfast. Right. And that's where the germ was spawned, if that's the right verb I want, for the academic leadership program. Right. Because I could see the one day workshop that we were giving new chairs might have been appropriate for matters like legalities and right. procedures, but it was not Maybe appropriate. Might keep you out of jail. It, that's right. And we need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but we also need to build a community of conversation amongst chairs and our other leaders on the campus. And we needed to do that again, not only for the present crop of right. chairs, but for their own coming. So we um, designed, out of that, those breakfast conversations, we designed a proposal. And uh, while it took two years to get it funded, we got over a half million dollars for two experimental years for an academic leadership program that would have not only established leaders like chairs and directors across the campus, but also, those whom we guessed, because they'd been fellows usually at this point, right, right. got an early look, right, you see. Right, right. Uh, they were going to be leaders on campus, not just, the, not just the chairs. So that's how the academic leadership program began, out of need we perceived amongst our fellows. I'll give you a counter story, not meant to deride its importance, but to illustrate that it's best to respond 
to your constituents' definitions of need, needs rather than defining it a priori and telling right. them. Just, what, I, what I did secondly that was not so successful was to institute an ethics program, much needed and mm -hmm. so forth, et cetera, et cetera. But in one sense, it didn't come out of the constituency. It came out of my head. Right. And, I, and I was so happy when the philosophy department came and said they were interested in it. But the Power Center yeah. for Ethics actually was birthed out through that process. It, it did. And now it exists and, and has and its life. Great, and great appreciation on both sides, right. and all sides rather, right. that, that we were incubating that. Right. And that's what I would now call it. We were incubating it. We thought we were going to own it, and we didn't find out it wasn't a good match. So we passed it on with great uh, morale and thanks and hallelujahs uh, but in the passage. If, but I also have the impression that, 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 again, your board was part of that conversation. And by that time, you had a board that had a very strong sense of what the mission of the Institute is. That's right. And they wanted you to really stay focused right. on that. That's on right. What the candor that accompanies creativity is absolutely essential for creativity. And so that would get uh, a little uh, review by the board. It sometimes became gentle rebukes. Tyson, you're, pre you're creeping again. <laughs> you know what they meant. <laughs> oh, well, uh, maybe you're right, right. So we had some interesting direct right. conversations. Because uh, uh, my impression is you created, it became a very strong board. Oh, yeah. Strong in the sense that it had, yeah. you had strong people on it. That's and they right. had strong opinions. And they, right. they, they, they were not shy about letting you know what they thought. And that was, uh, that was the chemistry exactly we, yeah. we wanted to yeah. have. Because that certainly is what happens in, among the fellows. Yes. The candor and the, uh, the tact necessary for a good conversation to have both candor and tact. So we've learned these uh, sort of aspects of how our practice... See, and I on. would say back to you yeah. uh, that, that one of the... All of that, just to add to what you said, yeah. One of the effects of the campus that makes us a different university, I think, is the is this ability to have conversation at this university in a in an atmosphere of civility and respect, yeah. which doesn't exist every place. No, no, I don't no. think to the ex it, it extent not. that it yeah. exists. Here. And um, I, I think that the thing to worry about is whether we've fallen into a whether we will. I don't know who we are, but the danger always is is to adopt a kind of 19th century gentility yes. that characterize the professor Which at least is artificial. In, in, in artificial and uh, no, nothing serious. Was, it was all about manners. Well, right. Hobbes says manners are small morals. So I think we ought to take that as a good <laughs> clue and say what kind of uh, manners do we have because it's going to talk about our values. Right. And so I, didn't, I wanted manners that were, as I say, full of tact and candor. To, or to get ideas, have a hearing amongst ourselves, and, and respect the minority voices around the table. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to sit here and pontificate about it, but it's hard work, and it takes more than one meeting. Right, right. <laughs> now, so far we've just got you at West House. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's a, yeah. there's a Hyde Hall today. There's a Hyde Hall. Uh, right. t talk about that. How, uh, at some point, it obviously came to you that West House, for all of its charm, it, was not was not sufficient indeed. for what the the program needed. Right. And so you needed uh, you needed a building and uh, talk about that. Well, uh, I don't think I initiated the idea of a building. Okay. I initiated an idea uh, with the board members of expanding West House. Uh -huh. And there was something in I the think back. I recall of, that. Yes. Something in the back of my mind that said to me, "Well, try it, but." It probably won't work. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> because we, yes, uh, board members put up money to hire an architect to do some drawings for us. And it, they were lovely. I mean, I, I still have them. Mm -hmm. I look at them in contrast to what eventually emerged. But it was out of that conversation yeah. with where we were going. Now, here I can be very specific. The bicentennial campaign for Carolina. 1993. Yes. We were able, though we were only f less than seven years old at that point, we were able to raise $4 million during that campaign without a full-time director of development. And so we decided that we were not going to stop our campaign, though the official campaign of the university would have a rest. And the $4 million you raised was, was that to go, that supported the fellowship program? Fellowship program, yeah. Exclusive of the fellowship and the support, exactly. So out of that conversation about expanding Westhouse uh, came the idea, this is not going to work. And then we had word from the planning office that this space mm -hmm. had already been assigned to a future development in the, in the music, uh, or at least the arts area. Right. So we respected that. After all, our fellows come from those precincts as well. 
so uh, there was a classic moment, as we now say in retrospect, when um, Barbara Hyde, who was a member of our board, having been previously a development officer uh, for both journalism and for uh, Mohead, uh, stood, uh, reached over and said, in your meeting with the dean tomorrow, tell her you have the first million dollars toward the building. Well, that got attention. That got your attention. That got my attention and certainly got the dean's attention, right? So uh, that was our, that was our so that launch. Was a, that was a launch. For a new building. For a new building. And uh, the chancellor swung in heavily behind it. Uh, on Autumn Sunday, the last one we held, there was an announcement made by Chancellor Hooker that the space we were, we were in right. Hill Hall, the space right. next to it would be the site uh, for the new Institute for Art. And that was, of course, a very significant decision because that was the last, last place plot. ever to be built on. Right. on and, and we West. found, had such wonderful discoveries. The archaeology colleagues did a dig right. by, by, SSS, by law and discovered that there had been a pre, two pre-existing uh, structures there. Early on in the 19th century, there was a hostel a private hostel right. for overflow from Old East and Old West. Right. So it's a student hostel, and they found a lot of interesting uh, artifacts, we're supposed to call. And then uh, later on, uh, I think it was the Five Delta Theater, it had a wooden structure that burned, yeah. but it was a, that's all private property in those yes. days, right? So we were building on two other structures, right. which, which we found uh, comforting. Uh, that we weren't de novo. The earth had been already, uh, shall we say, hallowed twice. Right, right. And so we had our dedication. We poured out our libation to the ground to the friendly gods who would support the upright of this building. And uh, what, talk about the th thought that went into the design of the building itself. And, uh, well, this sounds uh, what maybe it is. Uh, but truthfully, it sounds uh, expansive and self-congratulatory, but every major feature of that building went through a detailed discussion, review, and testing um, by the building committee, which had fellows, had donors, it had uh, friendly uh, alumni who were uh, in the business of building as well as architecture. Uh, we went through the most exhausting architectural search, uh, 30 Four architects were interviewed face to face. Right, thirty-four, and five of them came for final presentations. Yeah. and we had the great good luck of having McKinney, the, the then retired dean of the School of Design at NC State, right. to preside over that selection process, and uh, we got a very good architect, Jack Robertson, Robertson from right. a former dean of the School of Architect UVA. Right, and uh, we've never regretted that. He understood within ten minutes of my presentation to him in New York at his office, what we were about. And he was the first one to do that with such depth. And so he was clearly our man, though we went through right. all that rigmarole, and necessarily so, that we, uh, we came out on top. My favorite story about the construction of that building is while I was chancellor, I was con and while the building was under construction, I was conducting someone on a tour of the campus mm -hmm. who had never been here before, and right. I took them over, and we just walked, we'd come over from the Moorhead mm -hmm. Planetarium, walking toward the construction site, and I, and I, before I could say a word, he looked at, he pointed at the building, and he says, is that a restoration? <laughs> and I said, that nails it. We, In we some ways, it, it was. Well, yeah, it, yeah. It's what we wanted, it's because we wanted indeed. the building to look like it had always been there. Well, my formula was a conservative external and a radical internal right. dynamic, yes. the I right combination. You achieve and that. I love the idea that it opens out to the street yes. as well as to the south, uh, to Person Hall. I like the two-way between, you can walk right through the building and get in campus and off campus. And the symbolism of the low wall, we don't have gates here, we have low walls. Right. Uh, it's very important to our understanding of our mission as a civic uh, university. You, you haven't said enough about Barbara Hyde, I yep. think, because she played Obviously, a key role, not just yeah. in the in the gift for this building, yeah. but on as a major person on your board and and intellectually uh, and and artistically, uh, Barbara was a student of mine in honors right. uh, course, um, and uh, we go way back, and then she went to the Peace Corps and uh, came back, and that's when she assumed uh, the apprenticeship, you might say, of, of a donor by becoming a, uh, a program officer for the Arts and Sciences Foundation. Then she became 
uh, the director of the Arts and Sciences Foundation, and so she had a lot of, you couldn't uh, trick her on anything <laughs> relative to a donor because she'd seen it all from the other side, right. right? Well, not that we would ever try that or need to try that, but uh, so we had an extraordinary uh, partner in, and leader in Barbara, uh, whose uh, style is indirect, but also persistent, and when necessary, candid. Right. Uh, so it's a wonderful set of assets that Barbara has. And her, her understudy was Mary Flanagan. That's correct. And Mary had been interested in this too because she didn't want to know what was going on in this little nice little brick building right. with the stubby white columns out front. <laughs> and so she walked in and met one of our secret weapons called Helen O. Wilson, otherwise known as Howe. Right. And boy, could she do things in the Howe way. Uh, they became friends, and so when Barbara became director of the Arts and Sciences Foundation, Mary was one of her assistant directors, and that's how she got assigned to the Institute. And having already been in crucial areas of North Carolina and Washington, Baltimore area, she already had a range of relationships that she could uh, take me to meet and uh, with good results. So who else would you want to point to or who've just been your major allies in, as you've moved well, of course, Michael Hooker right. was a, a, a great ally, um, and it's not accidental that the incubator upstairs is named after Michael right. Hooker. Uh, he saw to it that I went to the MIT Media Lab uh, uh, and to be exposed uh -huh. uh, to a lot of places like Carnegie Mellon and so forth. Uh, so that's a great. Uh, so Barbara and and but but the whole board, and Dick Richardson. I never forget oh, a meeting a part, with yes. Dick Rich and his provost uh, was getting a lot of stack, uh, static about our proposal to build a building, and the question was, can you raise all that money? You know, and they had only one model of money raising, namely uh, grants and you know research grants. I said, yeah, we can raise it privately. And uh, speaking of that, we also came in just before the big move. To to all the door of the building and rebuilding on right, campus. Right. Furthermore, we came in under a regime that allowed us to privatize the construction by a temporary foundation. Uh, again, the hides were crucial there. Right. And then it comes back to the university as a gift, as the owner. It, it was a wonderful model, especially when the university was was uh, burdened with excessive control by the state construction to exactly. be able to have the foundation. And we saved uh, we saved twenty percent of right. the total budget right. for, for going private that way in that regard. But I, as I think of other great people, you, uh, you Tom Keenan and, yes, and, Tom, and, yep. and Nelson Schwab and yep. Bob, Win Bob Winston, yes. uh, uh, well, George Well, the other thing Johnson. that I learned early on is that uh, you should uh, have at least two trustees uh, of different classes on your board. And Bro, you were very I, clever. I, I, I and managed the, to do that. And, the, and, they, and I never, they never let me forget it. <laughs> Uh, the, um, the, the importance I'm of sorry these, to you you train so them problems. well. Well, fortunately, it was not a hard sell in, in no, my case. I, I know. Uh, uh, right. Because I've been so, I love what you do and, and, yeah. what, and what it stands for. But these trustees mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, have been uh, magnificent in, in their right. stalwart support. Right. Trustees and, and your board members. And, and, and former students. We got the other thing I wanted to mention, though, was we tend to focus on Chapel Hill uh, exclusively, but we found that one of our most effective sites uh, for fundraising was people's homes. Ah. So we would ask uh, people we knew, would you hold a, usually not a dinner party, but a buffet. Yeah. And uh, we would like to bring two or three faculty down and we will have spend the evening talking maybe about a topic. It would be on, a little quotation would be on the uh, invitation. Right. And they would come, we'd have uh, s some discussion. And uh, they were excited because we gave them a taste in practice of what the Institute did every week around the table. Right. So we're doing it around their table. Right. And so we built a whole network of uh, dinner tables, shall we say, in places like Charlotte, Greensboro, Atlanta, New York, et cetera. And you, I know you had these, these great cells of support in Atlanta. You mentioned several times. Yeah. Winston-Salem was another really important town. And John New Burroughs York being crucial. New York City, yeah. Uh, yeah. Memphis, obviously. Hugh Boston, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. i.e. Cape Cod. Well, in short, rule, uh, and I just want to I want to conclude by saying to you that, and in my sense that, that what has been created here, which is a living, breathing organism, which mm -hmm. I'm proud to say continues to thrive, and yeah. I'm, I love having my own office in Hyde Hall, right. uh, has changed this university. And one mm -hmm. of the ways, significant ways, in my opinion, it's changed it. It's uh, you. We have created a community amongst the faculty. Uh, the faculty have a sense of
belonging at this university, and it, it's a huge retention factor. I think people yeah. people are reluctant to leave because they right. love being here, and, right. and the, the the community and collegiality of that the institute provides, I think, is right. is one of the, those aspects of glue that helps hold this place together in, in a significant I learned way. to talk shortly, in spite of all evidence to the contrary in this conversation. When we begin to fundraise, Mary Flanagan says, you've got to have one sentence that you say the whole story in one sentence. So here's the sentence. Okay. The Institute is devoted to recruitment, retention, and rehabilitation. That's not the word, but it was a reword, three rewords, you right. see. Easy to say, and even on a one story elevator speech. I think that's a great place to stop. Uh, Rural, thanks so much for sharing your insights. Yeah. Uh, you've shown us really what a good to, to great journey really looks like. It's, it's one of the great stories of Carolina. May I add, I, I never stopped teaching during this, uh, this 20 years point. Good I for you. I averaged two courses per You semester. still haven't stopped. Yeah, You've been teaching this afternoon well, as thank well. Thank you. Thank you, Rural.